With that, I would next like to move to the next Vedanga, which is uh, a part of the focus of today, which is Kalpa. And to speak about Kalpa as embodied religion, we have today with us Vidwan Vishwas Vasuki. Uh, Vishwas Vasuki sees himself as a servant of the god Vishnu out of love for him and by whose command he strives to study and preserve the Shastras with particular focus on ceremony and philosophy. More details at the link that you see on the screen. With that very brief introduction, I request Vishwas Ji to start his presentation. Hello, Namaste. Thank you uh, for uh, uh, having me here. So let me just uh, share my screen first. I suppose you're able to see my screen now? Yes, your screen is visible. Could you just put it on full screen mode? Yeah. All right. Let's go. Prathama Mangalam Acharami, Upendra, Tavasmi Dasa, Vadaradhana Yeda Mastu, so uh, today I'll speak about uh, Kalpa in a broad sense. What is Kalpa? Why do we need it? What, uh, what constitutes Kalpa and so on? And what can we do to preserve this very important Vedanga? So first of all, Kalpa is the art and grammar of ceremonies. Uh, that's uh, how I see it. Why do we need ceremonies? We need ceremonies to connect to our gods and ancestors. We all follow some philosophy. And uh, uh, if you have a religion, you follow some particular philosophy, or uh, uh, you try to inculcate some philosophy into yourself. To do that, you need uh, an excellent route is to have rituals. So rituals uh, and ceremonies help you refine yourself. So furthermore, it, this is not just cons uh, constrained to rituals like puja and so on. In fact, the entire life can be viewed as a ceremony. And uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, can be cap uh, that can be one way of uh, looking at uh, the concept of dharma. And beyond that, uh, the Vedas tell us that the entire creation, the entire universe, is a kind of ceremony itself. Like uh, if you uh, recall the Purusha Sukta, the entire uh, the creation of this universe, which we can see and that which we cannot see, was part of a, a ceremony conducted, a yajna conducted by the uh, Parma Purusha. So with this, uh, I will proceed to what constitutes rituals and ceremonies. So uh, within rituals and ceremonies, what you have is certain external actions, right? Uh, for example, you light a fire, you feed the fire, and then you uh, make some songs, you pray to the gods, and uh, you have some accessories. And uh, uh, what are these? Uh, some what are some of these accessories? Like the place where you perform uh, the ceremony, the the people who perform the ceremony, people who participate in it participate in a ceremony, uh, it's impo very important to emphasize that uh, in a particular ritual or ceremony, it's not just the inanimate, uh, inanimate objects which are uh, 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 ritual components, but actually the performers as well as the, uh, to some extent the audience too. So all these are uh, very important parts of a proper rite. And uh, beyond these external actions, sounds and accessories, what uh, we have is uh, the uh, another important thing is the internal imagination. If you conduct just the motions of a ceremony, a puja or a home or anything without uh, the corresponding internal imagination, then it is not as effective. It is not as satisfying, not to you, not to the gods. And uh, another uh, uh, another uh, uh, thing to notice is that uh, 
the these components, the external actions, sounds, and accessories, the internal imagination, all this varies with philosophy. If you are uh, uh, if you are a shakta, uh, for example, who is in uh, who is into virachara, your ceremonies will be markedly different, uh, both in internal imagination and external actions, from what uh, uh, Satvika Vaishnava would do. So it, uh, the uh, rituals have a very close tie with the philosophy if performed properly and with awareness. Now, what are the why is why is why are rituals important? These are core parts of religions. So, uh, uh, different Vedangas are different as uh, are defined as uh, are uh, uh, are uh, metaphorized as different parts of uh, of the Veda Purusha. Chandak padau to evasya hastau kalpo thapatte. So, if uh, Chandas is like the feet of uh, the Vedas, if Jyotisha is like the eyes of the Vedas, Kalpa is like the hands of the Vedas. So, uh, without hand, there's no, uh, there's, uh, you, you're a, a handicapped person. So, uh, if you kill ceremonies, if you kill the aware, you, what, what happens when you uh, uh, stop paying heed to ceremonies, rituals, and so on? You kill the awareness of philosophy. And uh, once you do that, you actually kill your own religion. And uh, by uh, killing here, I mean dilution or twisting. Uh, the, uh, uh, so if you dilute or twist the ceremony, if you dilute or twist the philosophy, and then you dilute and twist uh, the religion, and you shouldn't be surprised if uh, your children or grandchildren uh, are become enemies of your religion and your ancestors and your hearts and so on. So, uh, what I would say is Hindu self, this is uh, the uh, rituals are uh, uh, a kind of uh, self cultivation and uh, they are very much relevant today as they have always been. So, first of all, uh, let me uh, go through some uh, uh, further justification as to why rituals are important and then I will get into Kalpas themselves. So, first of all, uh, I would claim that rituals are effective. Uh, rituals and festivals do affect the psyche of its participants, uh, whether you participate by actually performing the rituals, whether you are, uh, uh, whether you are supporting it, whether you are, uh, 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 whether you are just spectating, it uh, they are uh, certainly uh, effective. Uh, how do we uh, observe that by some ordinary rituals which we have all gone through probably or hopefully you should have gone through a laksha right? I mean. This is it's a very simple ritual, and uh, once you do that, what what expectations will cement uh, cement in the what are the feelings of the brother, feelings of the sister, and so on, and what if uh, people actually participate wholeheartedly versus people uh, if you participate mockingly, so there is a certain uh, difference you would see. So uh, at least at the psychological level, it's very clear that uh, uh, rituals are effective. And beyond that, uh, there is effectiveness uh, which uh, cannot be easily proved. Uh, so I won't belabor that. Uh, and uh, so there are many kinds of rituals. It could be an upanayana or it could be a vivaha. And uh, in, even in other domains, we don't have any monopoly on rituals. You see uh, rituals in other cultures and contexts. For example, uh, the, on the left, you see a tea ceremony. So uh, it's a, a ritual, very, very highly ritualized, very uh, precise. Uh, there are things you can do, cannot do, things you can use, cannot use, and so on. And it's uh, very much admired throughout the world. And on the right, you see a flag hoisting ceremony. So uh, I recall once I attended the uh, flag hoisting ceremony in USA, in a university. It was so well choreographed and so detailed. Every move was uh, uh, very, uh, very precise, and it was a moving ritual. Even though I'm not an American, I, I don't have exactly good feelings about uh, any uh, that particular nation. Still, you could see that it was a moving ritual, and uh, it lasted no less than half an hour, just uh, uh, raising the flag. And uh, uh, there are mimamsas of rituals, not just in our tradition. You will find them in Confucianism, 
in Shinto uh, religion and so on. They're very good, actually. Uh, so these are universes, right? Uh, for example, here I show a quote by Sorai, a Japanese Confucianist. He says, the former sage kings realized that words alone were insufficient to edify people and therefore created ritual and music. This is very, uh, it's such a basic fact of nature that everyone recognizes it, whether he's Indian or a Japanese person or a Chinese person or a Native American or even a person who claims to be non-religious. So rituals help us live peacefully and harmoniously. That's easy to see. And uh, where, where does this effectiveness come from? It comes from uh, explicit aspects like Abhidhar. Uh, so what do the mantras mean? Are they like gibberish? If you, if you are uh, using mantras without understanding them, then you miss out on uh, certain uh, uh, aspects of the uh, rituals. And there are suggestive aspects as well. Even if you don't understand what the words uh, exactly mean, just because of some phrases or some sounds here, some uh, uh, actions you perform, uh, that uh, suggests something to you non-verbally or uh, even beyond what uh, the actions themselves immediately suggest. And uh, they communicate meaning in this way and inculcate, inculcate some values into you. Or for example, the act of tying the uh, Mangal Sutra, Raksha, and so on. And what is important here is, uh, uh, in, uh, especially in the subjective aspects of a ritual, is the power of a shared context. Like if you are a student of Kavya, you will have Kavisamayas. Uh, for example, uh, they imagine that uh, the uh, sunrise actually makes the lotuses bloom, the Chathakas wait for rain, and so on which is not necessarily uh, biologically accurate, but it, it helps you uh, communicate some ideas, some feeling. And uh, similarly in rituals, uh, you have uh, uh, this shared context by which the suggestive aspects especially are communicated easily. And so if you are a participant in a ritual, if you belong to the culture, the tradition, uh, which uh, 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 of which the ritual is a part of, then, you have uh, this shared context and you uh, benefit from these suggestive as aspects even more easily. Now, the second claim is that uh, ritual celebrations increase happiness. This is uh, uh, actually a, sub sub uh, a subset of the previous thing, which is virtual celebrative. Uh, so it's easy to see anyone who has done Deepavali, who has burst at crackers and so on, obviously knows who has seen such art who has uh, looked at, uh, participated and uh, uh, observed uh, Utsava in, let's say, Nilkote, you will uh, just see uh, how it is full of art and art moves and art makes you happy, right? And uh, Holi, of course, is an excellent example. It lets, it lets people play, uh, be happy and so on. So, uh, 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 let's go into a little bit of theory, a little, uh, couple of uh, definitions. If you are a practicing Hindu, you observe rituals. If you are not observing rituals, if you just have some ideas, I'm not, I'm not sure that you are a practicing Hindu. I don't think uh, that uh, fits actually. Uh, it may fit for some people, but mostly it doesn't. It's a good litmus test. Uh, so, uh, Hindu rituals and festivals, along with their uh, impact on the psyche of the uh, practitioner and surroundings, can be called uh, refinement. And why do the why do some people uh, downplay rituals? What is their problem? Let us examine their point of view, right? So uh, you can re uh, very effectively resist the effect of a ritual by considering it silly useless by saying that you don't have any time for it, by saying that it is evil, it perpetuates evil ideas, patriarchy and whatever things you don't like. Uh, for example, you can have, you can be a person who has a beard and who doesn't stand up for the national anthem and you don't benefit from that uh, ritual. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is the way you can resist very effortfully the effects, the good effects of a ritual. So uh, to uh, move beyond it, you need to be a Satriya, a person with a sympathetic heart. With that, you can certainly benefit from uh, ceremony. And uh, 
uh, here is an example how do you resist being moved by uh, moved by ramayana uh, you can say that's not rama that is just an actor if you are looking at a play and you can make things like make up uh, objections like uh, monkeys can talk and eagles too how is that possible and then you can uh, say uh, things like there never was a rama it's all made up and these are in the context of uh, participating in the ceremony or uh, benefiting from it all these are uh, ways to resist being moved by ramayana the essential truth within the ramayana uh, then of course you can ask such questions in other contexts but uh, not in the context of a ritual uh, so uh, here is a classic uh, tale i like uh, a real incident uh, recorded by a german christian a balinese hindu actually uh, responded to his objections uh, by saying do you want to know whether the story is true or whether or merely whether it occurred so another problem which uh, people may have with uh, rituals and ceremonies is that uh, i don't need this refinement in that case i don't need uh, rituals and ceremonies okay fine you are you may be an extraordinary person you may have crossed the river but uh, if you say i'll just burn all the bo boats you're not doing any uh, good to people who want to reach to whatever state you are in so uh, even this argument uh, another objection is i have no time for refinement i have no time for feeling all time for analysis most uh, so uh, the objection to this uh, the response to this objection would be to uh, observe that is such a mechanical life even worth living and uh, yeah, and even if, we, if even if uh, we accept that you don't have time and uh, uh, you are making a choice by not making a choice regarding the rituals and philosophies you are following because most of the life in that case is in some sort of a default mode you have not programmed in what philosophies you like what uh, ceremonies you like and so on so you are in some sort of default mode and what are these defaults where do they come from do they come from the sages the rishis as in our case or do, do they come from uh, 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 degenerate people uh, or marketers or companies or what not uh, so uh, here's a quote i like you should sit in meditation for 20 minutes every day unless you're too busy then you should sit for an hour uh, and uh, uh, so which is why it is uh, important to participate in such uh, such things habitually and ritually you should make time for them and uh, what of uh, what of what about things you don't like right uh, so if you have something you don't like in a philosophy or a ritual you can still retain the th the parts you like you can be creative and dynamic you can be selective yet sympathetic it's very important that uh, you should assume good intent on the part of the people who created the dharma shastra the rituals and so on uh, they wanted a happy society too they wanted success they wanted victory and uh, if you are sympathetic to them you will certainly benefit from them uh, their millennia of experience and insights uh, so how much is uh, so how much is too much you don't you may you don't some people you don't have to start uh, by doing all the rituals just find your balance something non zero uh, there is also the structure versus feeling uh, tension if uh, rituals make you feel more irritable you are doing it wrong if you are not grateful you don't have the right feelings the wonder responsibility and happiness you are doing it wrong and uh, philosophy is always primary uh, so ritual just by moving the hands and going through the motions is not uh, uh, properly performed ritual uh, so this is the choice so you have on the left hand side you can uh, refuse refinement you can uh, accept crassness you can have less art the less happiness no time tested defaults you can have no continuity in the past or on the right hand side which i prefer you can have sanskaras you can have more happiness you can be more in harmony with the society you can have better cultural memory you can withstand uh, threats better so uh, some uh, examples of uh, uh, ceremonies or uh, rituals would be uh, uh, would be some of these. 
uh, you can try a variety of uh, techniques, but I uh, strongly recommend that you be, partic you be partial to the ones in your particular tradition, whatever it is. Uh, some examples are the five Maha the, uh, which are, which are uh, ceremonies uh, aimed at uh, Devas, the Pitris, the Rishis, Manushyas, and Bhutas. And you can some, learn some mantras and songs. You can uh, play with murtis and so on. Uh, so uh, here is the, uh, so far I have motivated why you need ritual, why uh, it is not a waste of time. Because unfortunately we live in a day and age when we need to say these things. And I sincerely apologize uh, to people if uh, uh, they already knew all this. Uh, so uh, I come back to the main topic, Kalpa. Uh, so Kalpa, uh, what is Kalpa? Kalpa is a Vedanga which uh, relates to ceremonies and uh, ritual. And uh, what are uh, what are the boundaries of Kalpa? Uh, so a narrow view of Kalpas would be Brahmanas, Grihya Sutra, Shauta Sutra, Surva, Shulva Sutra, Dharma Sutra, and so on, fitting into the Pangas. Uh, so I would argue that uh, Kalpa is more general, right? I mean, uh, what are the boundaries of Veda? If you are an Arya Samadhi, you would say that only the Samhita and only certain Samhita, Samhitas are the Vedas and uh, not the Brahmanas, not the uh, Sutras and so on. That's your view, but uh, uh, the view I prefer is that uh, Mantra Brahmanatmaka Veda, Karma Brahma, uh, Brahmatmako Veda. So uh, anything which is a collection of mantras and rituals and philosophy, uh, it is the continuum with the Vedas. So similarly, just like grammar doesn't just uh, uh, describe Vedic Sanskrit, it goes beyond that. Beyond that, uh, what? How do you define your speech in day-to-day uh, 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 -day life? Uh, uh, what are the correct usages? Similarly, with Shiksha and Jyotisha, they're not. They are very much confined to. Uh, they are very much inspired by the Vedas. They have their origins in the Vedas, but they are much more than uh, being restricted to the Vedas. And uh, another matter of fact is that uh, 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 if you look at uh, Velcro, we use Velcro so much, zippers and so on. Velcro, uh, as far as I recall, was uh, invented specifically for space travel. And now it's used everywhere, right? So just because you have, cert you have certain conception, certain ideas, which originated for Shauta ritual or ritual very closely connected to ancient Vedic uh, practice, it doesn't mean that uh, it's restricted to that domain and not to. Um... So, in that sense, I would say that, uh, and uh, another point is that Vedic life is not just rituals. Vedas don't just talk about uh, Shrauta ritual and so on. They also talk about uh, life beyond it, how you should conduct yourself and so on. Uh, start my video. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Vedic life extends beyond rituals, uh, and uh, the uh, you uh, how do you how do you conduct yourself? So all that is in the domain of kalpa, and as such, it is not restricted to the Vedas and the specific Grihya Sutras, Shrauta Sutras, and so on. I would argue that it extends to the tantras and Kulti, which uh, claim to originate in the Vedas and which claim to have a continuity with the Vedas. They have. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the Pancharatrikas, they claim that uh, their Veda, uh, their, sorry, their uh, Pancharatra uh, tradition actually originates in a particular Veda Shakha or a Vedic tradition called Nekayana. And uh, there are many such uh, arguments, even in case of Smriti, Anumita, uh, Anumita Shruti, and so on. So I would say Kalpa, as I defined earlier, is sacred uh, rituals and ceremonies. And uh, uh, so the boundary is quite why? Uh, so, what are the sources of rituals? Uh, first of all, it is Kalpa texts, uh, the pristine texts which our ancestors have preserved with so much effort, the Brahmanas, the Grihya and uh, Grihya Sutras, the Shrauta Sutras, the Shulva Sutras, the Dharma Sutras, fitting in. Dharma Shastras, later Dharma Shastras, and so on. Uh, so what are the, uh, and uh, beyond this, the, beyond the Vedic part, the, the extensions are, as I mentioned, Agamas, Tantras, especially the Kriyapadas, the Dharma Shastras, the Ahnika Granthas, and later. And beyond, uh, besides the Kalpa texts, 
what uh, we have is uh, as a source for ritual is observed practice. So when you observe a ritual in practice, that can inform you as to how a ritual is to how a ceremony is to be conducted, how uh, what are the things which are not mentioned but are increased in the shastras and so on. Uh, so uh, uh, it's important to note that uh, both these sources of rituals are checked against each other. You have a kalpa text. Uh, they tell you what things are wrong in a particular performance, ritual performance. You can see that uh, the uh, ritualist is not doing these things properly and so on. And uh, uh, also the observed practice practices act as a corrective to the kalpa text based on the desha and kana, right? So uh, you have some sort of, a, uh, uh, in the ages past, our ancestors actually uh, performed gavalambha, ashwalambha and so on, which are prohibited today. And uh, so you, you get an idea by observing the practices, what modifications are to be made in the prescriptions in the Kalpa text while performing the rituals in this day and age and in this uh, location, right? So you have some sort of a controlled change. You allow control change. This is uh, 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 these then are the sources of rituals. And uh, how do you uh, prepare, uh, how do you preserve and propagate these rituals? So, First of all, I should uh, frankly admit that uh, my intention in uh, participating in this talk is to not just introduce rituals and argue for them to uh, ex uh, explain my view of what Kalpa is, but also uh, this aspect uh, to uh, request your help and participation in their preservation and propagation, uh, which is my particular interest and uh, for various reasons. So, what what is uh, required in order to preserve? Uh, sorry, uh, okay. what is uh, required uh, to preserve this uh, very important Vedanga? What we need is uh, uh, a guild of ritual specialists, right? In the in case of the Vedic tradition, it is the uh, Brahmana Jati, the descendants of the Rishi, the Rishi Putras and the Putras and so on, which uh, for whom it is a manner of honor. To specialize in this uh, uh, in this Vedanga in particular, uh, as whether as uh, Purohitas, whether as uh, Archakas, whether as Aradhakas, right? Uh, uh, despite enduring ridicule, economic hardship, and so on, the only reason uh, they uh, continue to uh, and specialize and uh, as specialists in this uh, domain is because it's a matter of honor for them. It is. It gives them uh, a, a meaning to their uh, life. It's a part of, you can say, their uh, bloodline. And uh, I should also note that it's not just uh, a matter of uh, preservation and anyone can do it. These persons and animals are actually ritual components. Uh, rituals, as uh, described in the uh, sacred texts and the performances, they make it clear that the ritual performing are ritual components. He has a certain connection with uh, some ancient sage or tradition, which makes him eligible to perform this ritual. So even in ritual components, the preservation of ritual specialists is very important. Of course, what I have not mentioned here is you need to preserve ritual components as well. Like uh, you need uh, you need Vidhitaka tree to create a dice for some uh, rites. You need uh, Vaikankata tree. Uh, and uh, the wood, the branch of the Vaikuntata tree, which grows in a certain direction, so that you can create a kind of uh, uh, dervi out of it. Uh, dervi would be a kind of spoon or a ladle out of it. So uh, you should, uh, to preserve uh, kalpa, you need to preserve these components. And also you should preserve the texts, right? And you should uh, do, uh, this is my particular interest. I uh, uh, get a lot of uh, uh, text typed. You can, uh, my, uh, 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 my humble effort in the service of my gods is, uh, uh, can be viewed in this uh, URL here. Uh, you can, you're welcome to uh, participate or contribute however you like. Uh, so uh, if you have Kalpa texts easily accessible to a modern uh, uh, practitioner or a connoisseur, or uh, uh, even a spectator, it would be enormously helpful in preserving this tradition. And another uh, uh, aspect of preserving rituals or uh, these signs of ceremonies is observed practices. 
right? You can make observations, you can make videos. If you do that, you're doing an excellent service, at least for now, to uh, the, towards the preservation of this Vedanga. And uh, uh, so regarding the, the uh, specialist preservation, what uh, I have some uh, uh, imagination, right? I mean, uh, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, I, so the, what are the problem, problems uh, ritual specialists face today? They don't have job security. They don't have money. They don't have prestige. No one gives uh, brides to them. So they can't even propagate, uh, perpetuate their family. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in my imagination, we should uh, have some sort of uh, 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 campaign uh, to preserve Brahmania, for example, which is my particular interest in the uh, dramas, the villages, uh, by providing them all these things. I don't know how I can do it. I don't have the resources, but if you uh, have, have ideas, uh, you're welcome to talk because I'm a dreamer. And uh, that's one thing. And another thing is uh, text preservation, which I uh, and many others do, is in the service of uh, these uh, ritual specialists. And furthermore, if you have ideas to exchange, I uh, have created this mailing list uh, where you can participate, you can discuss kalpa, rituals and ceremonies and so on. And uh, then uh, some examples for uh, uh, how uh, ritual, uh, uh, how ritual texts or ceremonies, uh, uh, some texts uh, uh, we are preserving are uh, indicated here. Uh, in the video, you can just copy this URL. I'll uh, just show you, uh, for example. So Yajurveda has uh, uh, sutras, right? So uh, if I if I if I uh, say in my uh, daily uh, introductions that I am a follower of Apastamba Grihya Sutra, and I have never read uh, Apastamba Grihya Sutra, then I'm a hypocrite. Uh, or uh, if uh, it's okay if I say it in the beginning and if I'm uh, uh, if it's just been one year past my Upanayana or something, but if you say it through throughout your life, and if you don't even know Sanskrit and you don't even know what Apastamba says. Then Apastamba Sutroham Smiti Vachanam, Vachanam Bhoti, Lok Pratharanaya Bhoti. So, uh, what you can, uh, 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 here's an example of how one might present this very important text, the Apastamba Grihya Sutra, to some uh, modern person, right? I mean, uh, so you have here uh, a bunch of sutras, Agni Mitha. And uh, when I see this, I want to be able to see. I, I want to be able to see what it uh, means, what it says, right? So I uh, I should be able to see, for example, the translation. Here is a translation by Oldenburg. Uh, having set the uh, having set the fire in a blaze, his truce east eastward, pointing the grass around it, and uh, so this is. I, I should at least know this much. Even you. you may Sanskrit, I should at least know the translation to it. I should have read it. And uh, if I know Sanskrit, uh, I should be able to see uh, what ancient commentators say. For example, in this case, Sudarshana Suri says this. Haradatta has no comment on this particular thing uh, in this uh, section. Uh, what Haradatta says, what Sudarshana Suri says. Right, I should be able to see all this. What are uh, what are the key things he says? Uh, so uh, this is how, in my view, kalpa text should be preserved and presented in this particular day and age. At least as long as our modern civilization lasts, which is as long as how how long our uh, oil and nuclear energy etc. lasts. Um, so this will go a long way, in my view, to uh, preserve this Vedanga. Another example would be okay. This is I think the same thing. Uh, so, uh, in case you are a Sri Vaishnava, uh, you have uh, something called uh, Ahnika Grantha, how you should conduct yourself throughout the day and so on. And this is one such example which we have curated, which is uh, Ahnika uh, Grantha by uh, a servant called Gopala Vishka. So, uh, for example, here I am able to see what he says and what the commentary says about what he says and so on, right? Uh, so, uh, in short, this is my view of uh, how uh, text should be preserved and propagated and uh, uh, you're welcome to uh, imitate or copy. So all this is, by the way, free. You can copy it, you can, uh, uh, they're usually published books, 
you can copy it, you can practice it, it's even more wonderful. You don't need any permission from anybody. Uh, so this, uh, this is uh, uh, briefly uh, my pitch about uh, how we can serve this Vedanta. Uh, what are the challenges uh, in this particular text preservation effort type base? Well, the main challenge is that I'm not able to get proof preserved, right? I have a text, I OCR it. Uh, I mean, uh, you have a scan text, you OCR it, you have to proofread it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, if you want to be a proofreader, you need to know the script, whether it is Telugu or Devanagari or Grantha. And uh, you should uh, have some sort of de dedication and love and uh, uh, bandwidth to, uh, for this uh, work. Uh, so the problem I face mainly is job security. I mean, people want a, a stable job. They want a famous organization to uh, fund their uh, uh, livelihood. Uh, they should be able to say, I'm working in such and such a place. You can't blame them. Otherwise, no one will say you're worthy of being my son-in-law or whatever. <laughs> You should uh, the proofreaders need uh, need to be able to trust you, which is uh, lacking in my case because I'm just a single person, not an organization. And another uh, small problem, which is not a big problem, is the uh, funds. Uh, more funds means uh, you can pay proofreaders better and uh, you can uh, get things done better. And another challenge is kinds of rare texts. There are many excellent texts which are not available easily, which are not scanned, which are uh, like. Uh, uh, printed like 120 years ago in, let's say, Telugu script or whatever. And the only people, only reason people will read them now is if someone types it in Devanagari and presents it and publishes it or puts it on the internet. Uh, so you are welcome to help and contribute. You are welcome to contact me about it. And with that, again, I thank the gods and I uh, conclude my talk. Sarvam Sri Krishna Paramastu. So with this, I uh, see some Q and A uh, uh, with the organization organizers. Uh, no, so no Q and A. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to uh, ask. Otherwise, I will uh, conclude the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vidwan Vishwas Vasuki ji. I will just give a minute uh, to see if there are any questions specific to your presentation that pop up. Uh, but while we are doing that, let me just uh, share my screen from your end, uh, from my end, one sec. While we wait to see if there are any other questions, uh, we had a wonderful presentation, a really involved presentation, I would say, from a practitioner scholar, somebody who is very hands-on when it comes to preserving aspects of Kalpa. He covered primarily in his talk, he gave an overview of Kalpa, and this is from the Indian Knowledge Systems book again. He mentioned about the Shrauta Sutras and Gruhya Sutras, uh, a lot more focus on the Shrauta Sutras, I would think in his presentation and he showed primary source texts and how he's enabling uh, access to those primary source texts along with commentaries and other aspects of those texts in a way that is accessible to all and he also called out for people to contribute in the ways that they could please feel to feel free to reach out to vishwas vasuki ji now, Kalpa, as he had mentioned, the different components, he, like I said, had covered, uh, had emphasized on the Shrauta Sutras part of it, and briefly on the Grahya Sutras as well. Now, in the, during his conversation, okay, now I do see a couple of points in the Q&A box, Vishwas, if you would like to have a look at it, and if you have anything to respond to them. If you specifically want to respond to them, please feel free to do so. But I just want to mention this. Uh, in his During his presentation, he did very briefly talk about the Vedangas being 
you know, different parts of Veda Purushas, so people who might be looking for the primary source for that particular reference, it can be found in the Paniniya Shiksha, in the Paniniya Shiksha. So, Chandaha Padav to Vedasya Hastav, that particular verse is on your screen right now. Uh, in this book, Hindu Dharma, by Pooja Sri Chandrasekarenta Saraswati Swamigar, called Hindu Dharma, he's included this line on page 278. Shiksha is the nose of the Veda Purusha, Vyakarana, his mouth, Kalpa, his hand, Nirukta, his ear, Chandas, his foot, and Jyotisha, his eye. Now, it's perhaps from this particular primary source that we actually get this. Vishwas, do you want to respond to any of the messages that you see in the Q&A box? Sure. I see uh, two questions here. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, Telugu script repeatedly. Are there many texts in Telugu script? Yes. Uh, at least in the Sri Vaishnava tradition, uh, most of the texts are uh, in Grantha, uh, Grantha script or in Telugu script because a lot of uh, Sri Vaishnavas actually lived and flourished there, uh, including the Vijayanagara Empire as uh, the gurus. Uh, so, uh, I, at least in the Sri Vaishnava tradition, I, I, I personally benefited uh, in the last couple of months by reading the uh, text called, uh, uh, by reading a te text which was originally published in the Telugu script by uh, a person from uh, Agrahara called Lakshmipura, which is across the border from Karnataka in Andhra, uh, uh, regarding the Rahasyatriyas of the uh, tradition. And uh, uh, there are other such books, for example, Prapanna Parijata, the Ahubila uh, uh, Matha in uh, uh, Andhra actually has, uh, uh, has nourished scholars for a long time and uh, they have published uh, books they used to publish books in the Telugu script, and which are basically lost right now. I, I don't know if we can find copies of them. If we do, uh, it will be very, very valuable to transcribe them and make them available in the way I mentioned. And uh, another uh, thing I see uh, is, uh, sorry, just a minute. Where is the q and book? Okay. Uh, in comparison with uh, scripts of other languages. Uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, yeah. In regions people had switched to their languages. So, uh, so uh, in some sense, I think uh, my sense is that there are more such works, at least in the tradition I have examined, in Telugu script and in Granth script. Thank you, thank you, uh, Vishwas. Thank you. Once again, I appreciate uh, you joining us today and speaking on Kalpas and specifically also on the wonderful work that you are doing. I hope we have people who actually uh, connect with you on your mission. Thank you for joining us today.